For our meditation, shall we turn to Genesis chapter 3? I have a pure word of God to share with no extra aids like visual aids or PowerPoint, but this is a message that I would like you all to take into your heart. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. These were words that God spoke to man as a consequence of his sin. God is telling him, you were taken from the ground, and you will return to the ground. When God created man, he did not make him this way. Man was not supposed to return to the ground. God had an entirely different purpose for man. The Bible makes us understand that when God created Adam, he gave him seven blessings. First of all, he gave him eternal life. Eternal life means he, his soul is connected with heaven. It's the life of God within a person. And he is connected with eternity, with heaven. And the second blessing that God gave him was he was created in the image of God. Man reflected the image of God. Thirdly, he was covered with the glory of God. Man was all surrounded by God's glory. And every day he had fellowship with God. So those are four blessings. Eternal life, image of God, glory of God, and fellowship with God. In addition, man was an immortal being. God gave him immortality, meaning his body would never die. His body would live forever. Then God gave him dominion. And finally, God gave him inheritance. Of these seven blessings, note the two, the eternal life and immortality. What is the difference between these two? They both sound the same. Immortal means forever. Eternal means forever. So what is the difference between eternal life and immortality? Eternal life refers to the soul, while immortality refers to the body. Because of eternal life in his soul, man would have no death in his soul. And because of immortality in his body, man would never die in his body. So eternal life and immortality made sure that man in his soul and in his body would live forever. But when man sinned, he lost all seven blessings. First of all, he lost his eternal life, meaning there was death in his soul. His connection with heaven ceased at that point. His connection with eternity ceased at that point. Secondly, he lost the image of God. Thirdly, the glory that was covering him departed. Fourthly, he lost fellowship with God. He was cut away from God. Fifthly, he became a mortal being. His body would die. Sixthly, he lost the dominion that God had given him over all creatures. And finally, he lost the inheritance that God had kept for him. So he lost everything, everything, everything.
of all these blessings that he lost. In particular, God mentions mortality. Mortality means, man being a mortal being means, the body of man would die. And when he died, he would have to be buried. And that is what the Lord said. You came from the ground, now you shall return to the ground. God said you came from the ground because... God created man from the ground. If you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril, breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God formed this man from the dust of the ground. He was created from dust. Before God breathed into him, man had no life in him. He was just a collection of dust. So you can imagine what man was like. He was just a lot of dust particles gelled together in the shape of a human being. And we know there is absolutely no life in dust. Dust is merely powdered waste matter. None of us likes dust. Dust comes into our homes like an uninvited guest. And it doesn't leave. It won't go away. It settles on our shelves, on our books, on our clothes. And we hate the feel of dust. We hate the smell of dust, the sight of dust, the taste of dust. In other words, none of our senses welcome dust. Dust is something we do not like. And when we think of all the different meanings of the different phrases used with the word dust in it, it all has something negative about it. Some of the words used in English, some of the idiomatic phrases used in English, which are in the Bible. For example, to cast dust upon the head. Casting dust upon the head means you are mourning. It's, it's a sad thing. To sit in the dust means you are in extreme affliction. To shake off the dust means you are rejecting someone. To lick the dust means you're in abject humiliation and submission to someone. To throw dust at someone means you totally hate that person. In fact, the word dust is even used in the book of Job. It is used to mean the grave. Job says, I will sleep in the dust. So... The Bible endorses our feelings about dust. We don't like dust. And all these verses tell us that dust is not something that we want to have. So if dust is something so ignoble, if dust is something so abhorrent, something so terrible, something that we wouldn't like, why did God use such a despised material to make this honorable creature that we all know as man. Why did God use such a terrible material to make you? Don't sit there feeling very happy about yourself. I just gave you some bad news you made from dust. Now why did God do that? God had a purpose in making man from dust. Because there was an earlier creation, the angels of God. They were not made of dust. They were made of an heavenly material. The angels were made of heavenly material. And they were very, very glorious. And they still are. Those who are in heaven are very, very glorious. But because some angels were so beautiful they began to admire themselves. 
And when they admired themselves, they fell because of their pride. Self-admiration is pride. Self-appreciation is pride. And the angels fell. Now God was going to make man after that. And God deliberately made man from a humbler material, from dust, that man might remain humble. Can you see, from the very creation of man, God planned that man should be a humble creature. God did not give man any opportunity to boast, right from the word go, right from his creation. His very material makes him humble himself. Although God gave him blessings of immortality in the body and eternality in the soul, although God gave these things to him, yet God always wanted man to remember this. You are only dust. Man must always say, I am only dust, I am only dust, I am only dust. That is what God wanted man to remember. And the Bible tells us even God always remembers. These, this man is only dust. You re read Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verse 14. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. He knoweth our frame, he knoweth exactly how we are made. And God always bears in mind that we are dust. So you can imagine, God planned and desired that man should be humble. But you can see how everything has changed. Today we are prouder than the angels. We have nothing to be proud of, and yet we are so proud. How we are fallen. And what about the serpent? The serpent that deceived man. That serpent also came under this curse. I give this sermon the title, The Curse of Dust. Man came under that curse. And God said, In the sweat of your face you will eat bread and you, till you return to the ground. Till... You go back to it because you came from dust and you will return to dust. But what about the serpent? The serpent also did not escape this, this curse. Scholars believe that the serpent in its original Edenic form was not a writhing reptile. It was not the snake that you see today. It wouldn't wriggle and writhe on the ground. The, the serpent in its original form scholars believe, had legs, and it was walking upright. But the moment it was cursed, it began to crawl in the dust. You serpent, you deceived man, you will spend the rest of your life crawling in dust. You read Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So he would be crawling in dust, and he would be eating dust for the rest of his life. There are two other verses that support this. You can note them down. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 25. Isaiah 65 verse 25 and Micah chapter 7 verse 17 that's Isaiah 65 25 and Micah 7 17 this curse on the serpent was so terrible that when time is gone and when the tribulation period is over and the millennium begins, and we know this world is going to have 1,000 years of freedom from curse. But at that time, the dust shall still be the serpent's meat, we read in Isaiah 65, 25. That's the verse you just noted down. When the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the lion, a baby can put his hand into the lion's mouth, when all the, the ferocity of 
carnivorous animals have ceased, at that time, the serpent will still be under the curse. It will be eating dust. Now, man came under this curse, the curse of dust. And when God spoke to man and said, you are dust and you will return to dust, I don't see any reaction from Adam or his wife. They did not realize the seriousness of this curse until one day a terrible incident took place in this family. They looked at the body of their younger son, Abel. Abel was dead. Abel was dead. And they were trying to figure out what exactly is happening. Abel is not getting up. Abel won't rise up. And it was it took probably took a bit of time for them to understand that Abel is gone and Abel won't return. They realized this curse is a very terrible thing on them. The son died before the father, and what a death it was. Murder. In the very first family where they had two sons, the very first symbols of creation. The first, Cain, became a murderer. The second, Abel, became the murdered, the victim of murder. But if you look at it carefully, you understand something. Abel came under the curse of death in his body. His body died or he proved, I am an immortal, I'm a mortal being. Because of Abel's death, they realized man lost his immortality. And because of what Cain did, he became a murderer. They knew he had lost eternal life in his soul. He became a symbol of death in the soul. Can you believe the two sons of the first man? One became a symbol of death in the soul. And the other became a symbol of death in the body. And thereafter until today, this curse remains on mankind. He lives, but then he dies and he returns to dust. And the fear of death has prevailed. And there are so many people all over the world who are very, very afraid of death. And in their desperate attempt to escape death, they do all kinds of things like sealing themselves in cans of liquid nitrogen, hoping that by this cryogenics, they can live for 1,000 or 2,000 years. But it's impossible. Mankind will never defeat death by his own attempts. Dust shall return to dust. That's a curse upon all men. But let me tell you, there is a deeper side, a sinister side, an evil side to this curse. This curse did not simply affect the body of man. I want to tell you how it affected the soul of man too. As man fell under the curse of dust, his soul lost eternal life, meaning it lost its connection to heaven. Now, if I may describe the soul to you, the soul is the soul is like a sponge that absorbs, or it's like a pot of glue that sticks. The human soul is like that. Because it is our soul that has the ability to love, affection, and so on. So you can imagine the soul like a little person inside you with a pair of sticky hands ready to grab. And if it holds, it won't let go. So the human soul was like that. And with that soul, man was holding on to heaven. He was clinging to heaven. But the moment man came under the curse of dust, he lost his connection with heaven. No, man is having a sticky soul, a pot of glue, a sponge. That's, in the, that's the soul of man. Now, if I lose my connection with heaven, then I have to hold on to something else. So what did the soul of man begin to do? Because it lost its connection with heaven, now the soul of man began to connect with the earth. 
because it lost its connection with the pleasures of heaven and the pleasures of God's presence the soul began to cling to the pleasures of this earth and thereby began began the curse of dust in man's soul man man's soul was clinging to dust charles spurgeon said our souls naturally cleave unto the dust charles spurgeon made that statement but thousands of years before charles spurgeon made that statement what does the bible say in psalm 119 psalm 119 verse 25 my soul cleaveth unto the dust yes the bible says this truth so clearly my soul cleaveth unto the dust what does this mean the soul within you it's an eternal part of you made by god and that soul is meant to love heaven and cling to heaven and and spend eternity in heaven but now the soul is clinging to the dust of the earth mind you it's not the physical dust the physical dust is in relation to our bodies but the soul of man is clinging to dust what dust this is the pleasures of this world the sins of this world you can see all mankind there are so many people who are desperate to satisfy the longing of their soul they go after sin today in the desire to fulfill their lusts people are committing all kinds of sins they smoke they drink why do they drink why does a man drink why does a man smoke he knows it's bringing damage to himself every pack of cigarettes tell you that gives you the statutory warning cigarette smoking is injurious to health and you know it brings damage to you it's killing you but what the the warning tells you is it brings damage to the body but there's a greater damage to your soul you are drinking in death and you are hastening your death and yet man cannot give it up how many people give up smoking i know of a man said it's very very easy i'm going to tell you a little joke it's just two lines but not everyone's going to understand some of you will understand and laugh the others will pretend and laugh So if you do understand laugh I don't like to explain this joke because it loses its flavor. I hope you get it. All right? This man he said it's very easy to give up smoking. Very easy. I've done it many times. I hope it sinks in. If it doesn't, you can meet some of our enlightened brethren. later and ask them what exactly was funny why did you laugh so much probably they laughed because no one else did he said it's very easy to give up smoking i've done it many times think about it i found that very very funny the fact that he had to give it up okay let me explain it the fact that he had to give it up many times means each time he kept going back to it you are dust and you will return to dust man tries to give up sin and he goes back to sin it's a terrible curse a terrible bondage one day my friend asked me you're a christian i said yes oh you mean to say you're like one of those very strict christians you give this up and you give that up i said yes oh poor you he said i said why he said i feel sorry for you look at me i'm free i can do anything you're bound i said no i'm free you are bound to your sin you can't give it up and his eyes opened he realized i can't give up my sinful ways if there's anybody here who is under this curse of dust you must give it greater thought it's a curse that you should not be under why is it you make an attempt to give up something and you keep going back to it my soul cleaveth to dust for others okay it may not be cigarette smoking it may not be alcohol or drugs but there can be different kinds of pleasures of this world that you are attempting to give up something that is holding your soul in bondage 
For some others you may have given up all these things. And you may be a regular church goer. You may be a very good believer. But my question is, is your soul clinging to Jesus? Clinging to heaven? Because that is how God made us. And the soul that has been freed from the curse of dust will be a soul that is panting for God. Will be a soul that is panting for heaven. The psalmist says, my soul pants for God. And then says, when will I appear before God? Meaning, when will I be in heaven? He longs for God. He longs for heaven. That is what a, a, a believer's soul must be like. Although he lives in this world, he's longing for heaven. But if you are not longing for heaven, the, some people are not longing for that greatest promotion, the greatest promotion of being in heaven, exaltation, exalted above everything, going to Jerusalem and Zion. For some, that is not the primary thing. If your soul is not longing for promotion in heaven, then your soul will be longing for promotion in the church, promotion in the world. In your workplace, you'll want to be promoted above others and you will do anything to get that. Or in the church, you want to be promoted, you want to be above others. That's something that can affect many people within the church. Even though you've given up your smoking, given up your drinking, it's like this. Your soul was clinging to one kind of dust. Now it's left that dust and now it's gone to some other dust. The pastor whom I often speak about, Pastor Wesley, who, who often give, gave us, when we were brothers, he used to give us different pieces of advice. One piece of advice he gave us as servants of God, he said, servants of God should never create their kingdoms. So I asked him what he meant. He said, when you have a kingdom, then you have a throne and you dominate your rule, and you will never give up your kingdom. And then he explained how many servants of God, when they fail to realize they are only servants of God, they set up a kingdom and they cannot give it up. And when it is time, now for example, I have certain ministries to do. When I was in India, I had certain ministries to do. And there was a moment when I was told, Give up the ministry. It's your time is over. Drop it. I obeyed. But I found my heart really struggling. Especially when you see somebody else doing it. Your heart struggles. That is mine. That is mine. That is mine. Why is there that struggle? Why is it that you can't give up something that the Lord wants you to give up? In the will of God you have to give up. Because... Your soul was clinging to it. Our soul should not be clinging even to our ministries. I remember once, although I'm, I'm, I'm musical and, and uh, I realized at one early point of my ministry that this music was occupying too much of my mind and, and I felt... I do not want this to come between me and my Jesus. So, because of the struggle, I really prayed about it. I prayed and prayed and prayed and I told the Lord, Lord, deliver me from this curse. I do not want my heart to be attached to it. And that day, it was a very, very hard decision, but I said, Lord, if it is your will, I'm going to give up my, my connection with music forever. If it is your will, Lord. I always say if it is your will because my wisdom is so limited. But I know in my heart I began to put it on the altar. I began to hate it. I began. I really did not want it. And I said, I had a, I had a keyboard, a Yamaha. And I said, Lord, today let my pastor call me and say, pack up your keyboard and send it away. You wouldn't believe in two hours I had a phone call from my pastor. And he said, pack up your keyboard and send it away. I said, Halle. Then I realized he hadn't finished talking. And he said, then go and buy the latest one. <laughs> I said, oh. But I obeyed. 
I did it. I said, Lord, what are you trying to do? I couldn't understand. So I had to buy another one in its place, a better and a bigger one. And I had to set it up in my room. It was one of the latest and it had every function that any top musician in the world would, would really covet. It was a Roland Phantom X8 with an expansion boards and it could produce any kind of music. And I set it up in a state on my room and I used it for one year as a tabletop. I had my papers piled on it, books piled on it. It was very useful. I never played it. The reason I, I felt I was cut off from it. It is so important that even if you have to do something, your soul should not be attached to it, should not be joined to it because that's a curse. That's a curse. If it comes to a place, you cannot give up even if it is a spiritual thing. When God says it's time for you to give it up, when Saul was king and it was time for him to give up his kingdom, he could not. When he saw the next king, David, he saw that this boy was going to take his place. Then his heart began to get jealous. His heart began to hate him. And it hated him so much in his heart, he even planned to kill him. And so easily we can have this wrong spirit. When it's time to put something aside, we begin to grab it more, hold on to it more. And we don't even know how to analyze our hearts. Therefore, dear believers, let me tell you this one thing. If your heart must hold on to something, let it only be heaven. And if your heart must hold on to someone, let it be Jesus. Our souls must cleave to Him. Everything else must be loosely attached. And when there is a time to depart, we depart. When there is a time to give up, we give up. Don't hold on to anything too tightly. Because if you hold on to it too tightly, at some point when you want to give up, it won't give you up. So relax your hold. And as I continue to explain, you'll understand that God wants us to be free from the curse of dust. Many young people, many children are also struggling in the church. Well, if you re read the writings of Job in Job chapter 20, you will see how young people are connected with dust. And that is the dust of sin. Job chapter 20 verse 11. His bones are full of the sin of his youth. His bones are full of the sins of his youth. Which shall lie down with him in the dust. It shall lie down with him in the dust. Many young people, many children too. As you go to school, you watch what your friends do and how they dress and what they say and how they occupy their time. Within your heart, you slowly develop a liking for it. Now, many of the children are like in a prison. They, their parents are very strict with them and wouldn't allow them to do certain things. So they, they impose rules on them. Okay, you cannot cross this point. All right. And you can't cross that point. All right. And this point. Okay. And you can't come to this side. All right. Can I go up? No, you can't go up there. Can I go down? No, you can't go down there. In other words, you're putting your children into a cage. And if you cage a tiger, what do you get? A caged tiger. It doesn't change the person. So what happens? Our children end up appearing very good, but within their heart, they are no different from the children of the world. They want the same things, they think of the same things, privately they do the same things, but they pretend, pretend and pretend. We push them into a life of pretense, because nothing genuine is happening inside. If there's no deliverance from the curse inside, what's the use of putting on a show outside? That is why even our children need to be freed from this curse. I want you all to understand one thing. If you're desiring something, whether it is a sin or some pleasure or a, a, a beautiful object or, or some ministry or your, your soul is desiring something and you think, if I can get that, I'll be satisfied. Let me tell you, you will never be satisfied. Because your soul 
if we understand the scripture correctly, your soul has been created to be satisfied only by God. Nothing but God. No one but God can satisfy the hunger inside your soul. You can put anything else inside, it won't fit in. You will always feel the emptiness. There is a God-shaped God hole in your soul. And only God is that puzzle, like, like a jigsaw puzzle. Only God will fit into that gap in your heart. Today, is there anyone here under the curse of dust? And you feel that you're, you're struggling to give up something. Your heart is attached to it. You make every attempt. You desire to give it up. And then you go back to it. Like the dog returning to its vomit. You are returning to that curse. And do you think you have to be like this for the rest of your life? Pretending, pretending, pretending. Christianity is not about pretending. It's about overcoming. So how do we deal with this curse? This curse that makes man go back to the dust. Go back to the dust. What did the Lord tell Adam? You came from the ground and you will return to the ground. Can you tell me that returning to the ground in one word? That is death. You will die. You are no more an immortal being. You are no more an immortal creature. You will die. So, if death is that curse of dust, what is the reversal of death called? Or reversal of that curse? Going into the ground is the curse. So coming out of the ground is the reversal of that curse. Man came from the ground, but because of the curse he is going back into the ground. But when he comes out of the ground again, that is a reversal of that curse. And that is resurrection. Therefore, resurrection is the way to overcome that curse. Man brought this curse upon himself. And only man can reverse this curse. Adam brought this curse upon the world. And when Jesus arose, he reversed it. That is what St. Paul argues. He says, if we can inherit Adam's death. Have you ever thought about it? Okay, Adam sinned, so what? Just because Adam sinned, how did it make me a sinner? If your father decided one day he's going to a shop, or he's, okay, your father decides, I'm going to be a bank manager. So if he becomes a bank manager, do you become a bank manager? Do you just inherit everything from your father? You don't. Except his bad qualities. But now you see, but Adam, Adam sinned. And he died. He became... Under a curse, now death came to Adam. Okay, Adam made that mistake. Why should I come under that curse? All mankind came under that curse. Now if that is true, why should the other thing not be true? If Jesus rose again, and I am his child, under in his generation, why can't I inherit that resurrection? That is what St. Paul argues. As we heard in the Bible reading, you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And you read verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of death. And of the 22. Dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He's saying this, St. Paul saying, if we can inherit death, then we must be able to inherit resurrection too. And that is true. Because in the next verse he says, But every man in his own order, Every man will be resurrected in his own order. Christ the first fruit. First of all, Christ. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Because Jesus rose again, therefore, we will also rise again. There is a hope for us. We can inherit that resurrection. We can be part of that resurrection. That is the truth of water baptism. We are planted in the likeness of death and therefore we know we shall rise, be part of his resurrection too. Now how did Jesus reverse this curse? How did Jesus cancel this curse? 
First of all, what did Jesus have to do? He had to partake of the death. First of all, Jesus became man. He came out as if he came out of the ground. He came, became a man. Then he had to partake of death. He became part of that immortality. So Jesus partook of that curse, but he did not come under that curse. Jesus partook of that curse, meaning he became as a, an immortal being. And that is what, sorry, he became a mortal being, and that is why he had to die. He became, he wanted to taste that death in order to redeem us. And that is how he is able to deliver us from that curse. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says this, that he took this curse upon himself that he might deliver us from the curse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Jesus took that curse upon him. In the Good News Bible it says, it's translated like this, By becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse. Jesus took that curse of death upon himself, that he might deliver us from the curse of death. Now what happened? Jesus took that curse upon himself and he died. But what happened? He conquered the boasting grave and he arose from the dead. By his great victory, he became the forerunner of all who would follow in his likeness and arise victorious in their particular order of resurrection. That is why the resurrection of Jesus is absolutely matchless in the good news. Because he rose again, therefore I will rise again. If Jesus did not rise again, there wouldn't even be a Good Friday message. Because his death would be of no use. In verse 17, St. Paul says, And this I say, that Sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 17. I'm sorry, you are in Galatians 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ be not raised, if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. Your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. You will never overcome your sins. Can you see what the resurrection of Jesus means to us? His death, of course, it means so much to us. We learn so much from his death. But if had he not risen again, all our believing would be in vain. But now that he has risen again, your faith is not in vain. Thank God Jesus rose again. So many people don't know the value of this. That is why in many Christian churches in different parts of the world, they don't have a hope in their death. They don't have a hope in their burial services. It is such a tragedy that in many parts of the world, Christians are buried without hope. Do you know how in, in, in our church burials, nobody has yet died here in the last one and a half years. So we haven't had a burial service yet. But you know when we bury a person, what we say and bury. But there are other places where they bury a person. Do you know what they say? Can someone tell me? I just hear a lot of noise. As they send the person into his grave, they say, if you're sure, just say it aloud. They say, rest in peace. Anything else? You are dust. And you go, can you believe it? Christians are buried with the curse. This is a curse. These are the words of the curse. And Christians are being buried with the words of the curse. You came from dust, you will return to dust. How sad, what a tragedy that Christians are buried with the words of a curse. The last thing that you will ever tell your beloved as you send him into the grave is, you are a cursed creature. And you push him into the hole and say goodbye. What a tragedy. What a hopeless funeral service. But praise God in our funeral services, we say something else in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. Oh, this is what we say. Oh death, where is thy sting? It's a bit sad that, uh, you know, you know, so can you do it properly? Oh death, where is thy sting? Just a bit the same. 
can't challenge it. Oh, death. That's better. Where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Carry on. But thanks, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? We can challenge death and we can challenge the grave because Jesus rose. How glorious to hear the victory cry of the saints. Therefore let us not fear. Because of Jesus, he reversed the curse of death, the curse of dust. We also have a hope. So if we want a reversal, our mortality should become immortality. And our dead soul should turn back to eternal life. We must therefore first of all partake of the soul's change. That is why the very first thing in our gospel is that we get eternal life through Jesus Christ. First eternal life in the soul. And as the Lord builds up our life, in the end we shall become immortal beings. This mortal body shall become immortal. The curse is reversed. Therefore, in these days, let us look unto our Jesus. He paid the highest price for us to deliver us from this curse. Therefore, tell the Lord, Lord, my soul is cleaving to this worthless dust of this world. But help me, O God, help me to cling to heavenly dust instead. Let me say the last verse and finish in Psalm 102 verse 14. This is what... The psalmist says, a beautiful verse, it's a reversal of the curse within our soul, that you will no longer cling to the dust of this earth, but instead, in the lives of servants of God, particularly we find in Psalm 102 verse 14, For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and favor the dust thereof. Favor the dust. The servants of God love the dust of Zion. What is this dust? Charles Spurgeon again says, Every grain of truth is like a grain of diamond dust. You would do well to prize it all. So our hearts that once upon a time were panting for the pleasures of this world, panting for sin, now it can pan for the truths that God is revealing to us. It can pan for Jesus. It can pan for heaven. May God truly enable all of us to partake of this glorious life where our souls can long for Jesus and long for heaven and long for the precious truths that God gives to us all along the way. Shall we stand?